For the second evening dedicated to the Diva del Muto and early Italian cinema in particular, um, the reason why we are doing this series now, it's in the three persons that are coming to the podium after me. One is Mila Tenaglia, who is the curator of this initiative and who had the idea of putting it together, along with Cinema Ritrovato and the Cineteca di Bologna. And there's going to be Eugenio Refini, who is the chair of the Department of Italian Studies here. When he arrived at the department a few years ago, he started teaching a course called Drama Queens, about uh, opera and the drama queens of opera. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then uh, Vito arrived to NYU. We collaborated with him on a lecture on the Marble Fawn, another silent film, when he was at Columbia. And everybody here was very envious that Columbia had somebody like Vito. And finally, as, a, as luck would have it, he's at NYU at Tisch and he teaches early cinema there. And we are here to celebrate the, present, the publication of his new film, Velvet Curtains and Gilded Frames. That's what's going to happen after these welcoming remarks. And uh, so you understand that the connection between opera divas, silent movie divas, early cinema, and the function that it had to connect different forms of art, performing art, uh, from live. And I always am reminded that a secretary general of the Ministry of Culture in Italy would refer to cinema as spettacolo dal morto. Listen to me. Because there are two main divisions in the Ministry of Culture. One is uh, Spettacolo dal Vivo, that includes opera, ballet, circus, and Spettacolo dal Morto, everything else, including cinema. So we are here tonight to show that cinema is not Spettacolo dal Morto, it's very much alive. And as you know, we have two more evenings coming, maybe um, Mila is going to tell us something more about it, but we have a full evening, so after me, it's going to be Mila, and then Eugenio is going to tell you something about the connection between the diva uh, of, of opera and the very phenomenon of divism that in Italy, of course, started much more with opera singers than with theater, even if we had a few theater divas, just to mention one, Eleonora Duse, um, and the, uh, the diva and the phenomenon of divism in uh, silent cinema. We have a full evening. I'm very excited to listen to my colleagues to talk about this and to enjoy with you Rhapsodia Satanica. Already the title uh, is very enticing. And without further ado, I'm, I'm asking you to please welcome the curator of the retrospective, Mila Tenaglia. Thank you. Hi everyone, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you for being here tonight and thank you Eugenio uh, to have the idea of this amazing class about uh, the drama queens. This is the program of the upcoming screenings uh, we are going to be able to see tomorrow and Friday. Just a few words about Rhapsodia Satanica, which is one of the my favorite movie ever. Um, it's an Italian silent film from 1917, uh, and it tells the stories of Alba Oltrevita, a woman who makes a deal with the devil to stay young forever. So the topic is already like... Uh, very contemporary to me, and also uh, it's very dreamy, and there are a lot of stunning cos costume changes, uh, 11 in total, and starring and featuring diva Lida Borelli, who is playing uh, Alba Oltrevita. Uh, also, mirrors are playing a big role uh, in this movie, and the use of the colors are incredible. And I want to leave the floor to Eugenio, and after that to Vito Andrensens, that is like the cinema film professor at the TISC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Stefano, for having us. Um, I mean, I just would like to say two words. First of all, I would like to really uh, thank Mila, who has been um, creating this series. Um, when uh, we began to, yes, please, another thank round you. of applause. Um, because she has done really a marvelous um, job. I remember, you know, a few months ago when we sort of began to sort of brainstorm a little bit about this idea which Mila had. Of course, she had a very big task, which was that of coming up with a list of possible titles. Um, and uh, then, you know, uh, cherry picking uh, in that list was yet another big task. And uh, she did it, you know, sort of graciously and with competence. And it's been really a pleasure to Thank be um, sort of preparing for this series um, together with, with Mila. Uh, the idea of uh, bringing divas to our stage was really kind of connected to a course which, as uh, Stefano mentioned, I've been teaching on a regular basis um, since I got here, which is entitled Drama Queens. Now, the course is on opera and sort of on operatic 
uh, drama queens and divas. Uh, but then, of course, what is particularly enticing to me was to think about the fact that uh, in the early 20th century, some of these operatic divas, who do a lot of things with their voices, transition to the world of silent film, where the voices are not heard, right? And so that's a quite interesting paradox to me in terms of connecting these two different worlds. Um, I'm not an expert um, of cinema, so uh, I've been learning a lot from this collaboration and uh, uh, I will learn even more tonight uh, uh, thanks to um, Vito's presentation. And uh, I just wanted to, again, sort of underscore the importance uh, to my mind to sort of connecting what we do as teachers here at NYU in our sort of classrooms and the possibility of bringing that knowledge, that expertise, uh, you know, on the stage of Casa Italiana and trying to kind of bring these uh, conversations uh, to broader audiences um, and that's really one of the most sort of satisfying experiences which we have uh, around here. So, um, you know, without further ado, I think we should really make the floor for Vito um, and then of course we will enjoy Rhapsodia Satanica yeah. all together. And then we will have a Q&A and a brief conversation with Vito afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, um, Stefano, Julian, Mila, Eugenio, Casa Italiana, for having me again. I was here a few years ago with a, a book on statues and cinema that I co-authored and where we watched the uh, poetic Il Fauno. Uh, tonight, Rapsodia Satanica is very much in the same vein. I think you'll uh, find, everyone will find something to enjoy about this film. Um, as I did uh, last time, I have to confess uh, to being a fake Italian while well, my name is Vito. Um, I'm from Belgium and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I speak some Italian, un po', and uh, my parents were fans of The Godfather, so that's how, um, <laughs> that's how that, everyone's like, oh, half Italian? No, not really. Um, so I'm here to uh, present my new book on early cinema, Velvet Curtains and Gilded Frames. Uh, as you can see from uh, the title probably already on its cover, uh, it, it speaks to cinema's relationship to the other arts. So I'm going to just very briefly say a few words about the European cinema of this time that you'll be seeing hopefully for the rest of this week if you come back uh, for the following two screenings as well. How they relate to arts, maybe a few things you should keep in mind while watching Rapsodia Satanica. And, uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards. Um, so uh, first, uh, hopefully, apart from divismo, there's another infectious disease that spreads amongst us uh, this evening, which is borrelismo. Um, speaking of uh, operatic intentions, uh, Lida Borelli was already quite a big star of theater before she transitioned to film and was so popular with Italian audiences that there were, I think, several words that ended up in the dictionary to describe this craze around Lida Borelli. So uh, like Beatlemania, uh, Lida Borelli had her own Borellismo. And from what I've read, or what I've been told to believe, this also meant um, copying some of her artistic poses, many of which we will see in the Rapsodia Satanica. So if you're walking out, you might find yourself drawn to take a veil or a scarf and wrap it around your head, take your hand to your head, um, and several other beautiful poses that we see play out in slow motion. And you can say, well, this is uh, Borelismo. Um, the film that we're going to see tonight is uh, somewhat of an oddity in its timeline. Maybe you've Googled the film before or you've seen it somewhere else and it has maybe different years linked to it, 1914, 1915, 1916, 1917. Uh, if we're to believe the uh, American press, this is from Moving Picture World and Motography, the film was actually already finished by 1914, uh, a little bit after the, uh, the start of the First World War. It was announced, we have screenshots, uh, but it wasn't released until 1917. And there are a few theories around that. Um, first and foremost, and what makes tonight such a unique evening as well, uh, even though we don't have live music, which we'll have uh, tomorrow, uh, this is one of those very, very rare films that has score made for it in its entirety by Pietro Mascagni. And apparently he took his time with the score, uh, meaning he took 
probably at least two years creating a score for this film. Uh, legend also has it, which is why the program says 55 minutes, that Mascagni was a fav famous composer and um, you know, this is his only composition for film, thought that the music was much more important than the actual film. So he said, the film will be 55 minutes. Um, so apparently they did re-edit at some point the editing, uh, the ending to make it longer, uh, but that's not a version that survives. And the score that we'll hear tonight is based off of this famous Pietro Mascagni score recorded live at the uh, Cinema di Trovato premiere of this restoration. So uh, these types of scores for silent films don't happen very often and very rarely in the 1910s. So it's quite a, quite a treat to hear something contemporary made partially for the film and partially for Mascagni's own pleasure. Um, so a, a good thing to know about European cinema of the 1910s is that you could see it anywhere. You didn't have to be in Europe. Uh, most of the films that were screening in New York at this time, uh, anywhere you know, up to the start of the First World War in 1914 and really through 1918, most of those were European films. Europe had a huge studio system before we had a studio system first in New York and New Jersey and later in Hollywood, California. And some of the biggest companies distributing films were Italian, Danish, Swedish uh, companies and uh, two big French companies, Gaumont and Pate, which are still companies today. So uh, this was, of course, very easy back in the day. All you had to do was swap out the intertitles and no one really knew where the film was shot, where it took place. Uh, even if they recognized the actors, not all of the actors got credits. None of the directors got credits until 1913. So these were presented as sort of company films in the same way that today maybe you go to see a Marvel film where you kind of know who the director is, but you don't really know who the director is, right? That's less of the point. You're going to see a Batman film. Um, you're maybe more concerned with uh, Batman himself than with who made the film. So that was true um, up until the First World War when for obvious reasons, film production um, stalled in most of the big film producing countries. And the United States sort of took over by default. So after the war, European markets were flooded with American films. And those kind of became the standard. But uh, the film that you'll see tonight and the next couple of days, those were the high watermarks of European and by extension international cinema of the 1910s. Uh, and this is a little scene from a Rapsodio Satanica showcasing some of those Borealismo moves as well. Um, what, uh, what also happened early on, right before the 1910s, it, when people started transitioning to making slightly longer films, when it was clear that film was going to stick around for longer than just a passing phase, is the rise of movie theaters, first in small bodega-like shops that would set up a projector, very unsafe, fire hazards and would show usually programs made up of many short films and then later in proper cinema palaces uh, the likes of which we rarely see today with 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 seats uh, in Paris and Copenhagen uh, in Rome as well and that transition that we see at that moment of trying to make longer films also involved trying to get a, a new audience for film Film goers before uh, the 1910s were, for the most part, uh, women and children, um, from the little information that we have, and working classes. But the middle and upper middle classes and the higher classes were drawn much more to the traditional arts. So they would go see uh, an opera. They would go see a stage play. They would even probably be more likely to go see a vaudeville show than to go to movies because of its reputation. And that started changing. Um, for the most part due to a few companies like Chines also, and because for the most part of one film called L'Assassinat du Duc de Guise, a, a French film, which was a collaboration between the famed Comédie Française, the, the French acting institute, in an attempt to try and make film more respectable by putting well-known actors from the stage in it, by creating a screenplay with uh, famous French writers, by using bigger budgets, and by creating these historical narratives that people would be drawn to that are more respectable, more serious. Um, this venture in 1908 was a huge success, uh, but it did lose a ton of money in, in the style of all good art films. Um, and what it also did is it created a craze for uh, more artistic films, the so-called art film, le film d'art, le film d'arte, 
everyone all of a sudden wanted to show art films because it meant that a much broader audience would come and see them. And this is also at the time that people started writing about film in earnest, uh, amongst which Ricotto Canudo, a famous uh, Italian theorist who lived in Paris, who started raving about film first as a sixth art and later as a seventh art because we included some poetry and some dance somewhere in between, um, and who wrote about ways in which to make cinema, quote unquote, more cinematic, right? What does, what does cinema have that all of the other arts don't have or that all the other arts do have but can't do quite in the same way? That was sort of the, the topic of the day. And um, much of what you see on the screen today is a result of that philosophy that the director of the film, Nino Auxilia, um, was also a big proponent of. At the same time, film was also seen as the future. It was often mentioned in the same breath as the modern dance of uh, people like Louis Fuller, who had uh, the American dancer who had a famed show in Paris at the Folie Bergère, and who created art that seemed to um, capture a, a modern, fast-paced society in a similar way to film. Um, but when it came to populating the screen, as is the case today with uh, Lida Borelli and uh, tomorrow in a, in a different Lida Borelli film, most of the people working in film in any capacity came from uh, the stage in, in some way. So Lida Borelli was already a um, famous, famous actress before she ventured into filmmaking. Most of the directors also had a theatrical background. And in a lot of European countries, even though it's always said that film and theater didn't go well together, people performed both in film and on the stage because obviously they're different media um, and they scratch a different itch. Uh, a lot of times that also means that theater becomes a big part of the storytelling of uh, films early on. And there are others uh, like the famous uh, dive of Italian cinema like Lida Borelli, Francesca Bertini, and Pina Menichelli who had quite a wide audience at the time even though they were you know, or are maybe virtually forgotten today. Um, one of those, for instance, was the uh, Danish actor Betty Nensen, less well known than the famed Danish actor of the time, Asta Nielsen, which also might mean nothing to you. Um, th the first European actor to get a, a, a contract with the Fox Film Corporation in Hollywood in 1915, um, after having established herself in Denmark as a famous theater actor actress and uh, film actress. So it, even in the US, people were aware that what was going on in Europe was the standard for acting. It's this specific look, not directly into the camera, but right beyond the camera that critics at the time were really raving about and that Lida Borelli would also often showcase sort of looking at the viewer um, or, or through the viewer is a, uh, a better way of saying that. And I've got these clip, clips looped, so you'll see them pop up in a variety of ways. Um, another a great model, apart obviously from the, uh, the acting standards of the stage, was the painting of the time. So if you're looking out for anything uh, in particular today as well, I, I would say try and see how the scenes are put together. The, the use of perspective, the camera is similar to you know, setting up a single perspective um, from, a, from a painter's point of view has the ability to look much further and to create these frames and frames so that we all see the same thing happening in one long take as opposed to the theater where if you're sitting all the way there or all the way there in the, in the front row, you'll get a slightly different perspective of what's going on. And another painterly technique of the time to uh, divert our action was the use of dramatic lighting um, and dramatic shadow known as chiaroscuro, which of course uh, the Italians knew like, like no other. So, We'll see uh, this model being used for the most part in the use of long takes. If these first European art films you know, influenced filmmakers that came beyond them, the, the great European modernists like uh, Antonioni, for instance, um, it's this long take model of staging their actors in a single take, using the space, subdividing it with lighting, with these little entryways, most of which were shot on sound stages or silent stages, I guess, for the um, silent era and which resisted cutting into the salient information. It was up to the viewer to put two and two together. Um, this model, um, which we see showcased here a little bit in Rapsodia Satanica as well, first with just dimming the lights in the background, 
to create a, a nice little foreground space. And in the, uh, in the second frame, with a, an appearance by our friend Mephisto, or the devil, in the deep background, peeking through the curtains. So there's no close-up of Mephisto as he comes in so that everyone's noticed. You have to kind of keep your eyes on the frame and in the lighting effects in its entirety. Um, this type of model, using just one simple setup, also allowed filmmakers to make an incredible amount of films in a short time. So most of these features, which range from 40 minutes, like tonight, 40-ish minutes, to uh, 90 minutes, were shot in a matter of a couple of weeks, sometimes even a week. Uh, the Nordisk Film Company, uh, like Chines, cranked out 365 films a year, so that's one film a day, <laughs> across various units, usually in small European capitals. And so even though more films were made then than, than there were ever at any point in history, uh, we have lost quite a sizable amount of them, so about you know, estimates from between 70 to 90 percent of, of all silent cinema is lost, but luckily we still have some of these uh, great examples. Even if they were cranked out, you know, a week at a time, they still showcase an artistry that became important for filmmakers working even today. And you can see that when you go through a lot of these films, uh, as I have for the book, specifically the access I had to uh, the Danish Film Institute's archive, which is very vast, you see all these types of setups being recycled and used as a model in a certain way. A lot of times the props will also come back in a different film. Uh, we'll have similar actors because they work with long-term contracts like they would in Hollywood. So, you know, someone working for seven years for Sinus, chances were you were gonna be seeing them in all the films. Um, so you got to see the players and the, um, the narratives were also sometimes a little bit similar. Uh, the Salome motif that you'll see today will also come back in a different way tomorrow. So there's these great little variations of um, tone. Uh, apart from uh, painting, I'll also mention the influence of photography. Uh, photography had a, a similar problem to uh, filmmaking in the beginning, only much earlier in the 1860s, in that it wasn't taken seriously as an art form. People thought you just uh, point your camera at something and it registers reality, and there's no real art in that. And so to combat that idea, photographers bonded together in a movement that's called pictorialism, meaning they wanted to be more like painting, and started using painterly motifs uh, post-production on their uh, photographs, oftentimes painting directly onto negatives and positive, positives, and engaging with these traditions of painting to get their art form established. Uh, and sadly, it, it, you know, it lasted almost as long as cinema to be recognized as an art form, but we'll see uh, certain moments in this film as well where we're taking a cue from these pictorialists, uh, photographers like Alfred Stieglitz and Edward Steichen, or uh, Anne Brigman here, The Breeze, which is very close to a shot in the film. And we'll see that come up in a variety of lighting effects, a lot of times silhouettes against sunset. Um, a little bit like today, if you were to think about what photographic effects are popular, just open your Instagram accounts and put in hashtag sunset, and we'll get maybe a nice overview of what that looks like today. And at the time, it were these types of compositions, the, the person at the window, the, um, the silhouette against the horizon that would come back and that people would find aesthetically, uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to the film. I'll, I'll add one more note. The, the film should really be conceived as a sort of poetry in motion. It is based on an original work um, by, coincidentally, uh, a poet named Fausto Maria Martini, and it's also a Faustian film, who uh, wrote uh, poems about Faust from a female perspective. And so what we're getting is uh, much more uh, of a poem of a film than, um, than an actual narrative convention. So uh, I hope you enjoy the film, and I very much look forward to talking more about it uh, afterwards. Thank you. Well, I think I, would really, I really would like to make the most of you know you here to sort of explore some of the aspects of this film, which I find just uh, fantastic. I mean, the, the let me be, maybe begin by sort of saying a couple of things about the fact that uh, um, this is you know the only 
uh, Mascagni soundtrack. Um, and of course, I think the music is such an important component in the film. And then maybe we can move to the visual dimension. But I would like to sort of stress the fact that uh, we have a composer who was extremely popular at the time, uh, Pietro Mascagni, um, who clearly is kind of playing with all sorts of genres. And the question of genres seems to be particularly relevant in this case because even the film per se is playing with all sorts of genres. The music is kind of a melting pot of things. Uh, I mean, I sort of, I can hear bits and pieces of, you know, sort of, you have Wagner, you have uh, the French tradition, is sort of Massenet is there. Um, and uh, of course, the choices which Mascagni is making maybe are less revolutionary than what he was doing in his own operas, but they are extremely interesting in terms of situating the story and the film in this kind of long 19th century tradition, which I think is also a very important chronological framework for your own uh, research. So maybe I think we can probably just uh, begin by talking a little bit about you know, your thoughts, Vito, on the question of mixing things. Because to my mind, both the soundtrack and the visual um, are undoubtedly bringing together so many different threads here. Yeah, for sure. I, um, well, the first place to start there would probably be the fact that um, the Italians, not just in the writings of Ricciotto Canudo, but also in, uh, in terms of its director, who was a, a poet, a famed playwright at, I think, age 17 already, had, had made... 15 features in, in a couple of years' time and actually uh, passed away at the front in World War I right before um, the film came out, I think a, a month before the film was finally finished. Um, so this idea of, a, of, a, of the Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk, the, the total work of art, uh, was very much in keeping with how a lot of people saw film at the time. Like It, it brings together poetry, painting, uh, music, which was always performed live at the time, color, which was always there at the time, but most of the prints we have, you know, the, the color didn't stand the test of time, or we have copies that are black and white. Um, and, and yeah, this is one of those rare films that um, brings it all together so nicely in the version that it, that it survived in. I mean, I do think it's interesting that we have, uh, just to put it in context of how rare it is that we have a score that survived, the, the one... Uh, the one obvious example is the French film I mentioned uh, earlier, L'Assassinat de Duc de Guise, the film that kicked off the art film craze, had a specific soundtrack made for it by Camille Saint-Saëns. That's sort of a standout example. But then if we're looking further, it's not until the late 1920s when there are maybe one, two scores compo composed for film, and very rarely would they have been performed as well. So... It's also one of those things where I think now we take it for granted that we can see it and hear it with this score. But probably when it was performed at the time, maybe it was shown once with the entire orchestra. And then, you know, whoever had a piano, violin, was going to do the accompaniment like we'll have tomorrow. We'll have a former early cinema student of mine, Levi Pugh, doing some accompaniment. Uh, they would have given their own sort of color to the film as well. So to, to see it in this way... I mean, I would like to know where the Monty Python horseplay came from, whether that was part of the original score or not. But, uh, but no, yeah, I think, it, I think it stresses a lot of uh, interesting things. I mean, obviously the operatic diva dimension, which we haven't mentioned too much, is a big part of that. Some would say the acting in this film is operatic, at the very least dramatic. Yes, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and so I, I do feel like there's a sort of tongue-in-cheek nature about the, about the people really love this type of, you know, overacting in the same way that people like uh, Al Pacino today, maybe, um, whether it's at the Oscars or anywhere else. Like there is a, a sense of craft there that, you know, is connected to that as well. Not everyone can pull it off. You're right. Yeah. I mean, but this is very true. And actually, of course, she does a fantastic job in sort of uh, uh, coming up as uh, the the true diva in here. And she's, as you were sort of reminding um, us all about it earlier, the, this kind of borelismo thing, you know, the idea that uh, most of the gestures, the movements, um, of course, they have a meaning within the story, but they're also the diva Lida Borelli doing that, right? And that's something which, of course, gets to the audience. And that's part of this um, uh, diva tradition, which certainly goes back to opera. 
also to spoken drama. I think Stefano mentioned Eleonora Duse earlier. We could imagine, you know, we think of uh, Sara Bernard and so many other great actresses uh, who were building into this tradition. Of course, what gets to be to my mind, but potentiated in the, and strengthened in the silent film is that uh, the body and the gestures is all they have, right? Because, of course, you know, they, they cannot really use the voice, or at least we don't hear that. And uh, so the effect of sort of exaggeration um, works so powerfully on us, and I think it still works powerfully on us today, um, because of this particular element, the lack of the verbal, which, of course, in both drama and opera is instead crucial. And of course, the music here partially compensates the absence of um, verbal discourse, uh, but yet we are kind of, you know, sort of uh, uh, blown away by this, um, the gaze, right? I mean, and the way in which they use eyes. This is true of Lida Borelli, but also of the other characters. I've always been intrigued by the way in which eyes get to be so eloquent in silent films from this time period um, and the kind of work they do. Yeah, there's a, the example I showed of uh, uh, Betty Nansen earlier, the, the Danish actress, right. uh, who was known for, I guess we always say, before Betty Davis' eyes, you had Betty Nansen eyes. That's, there are headlines about her specific stare beyond the camera. And I feel like that's something that um, Francesca Bertini, Lila Borelli, uh, Pina Benichelli, all these, these powerhouse actors have in common is that they one, they have very big eyes, um, and they have a very clear way of utilizing them on the screen. Um, that and the chin, I think, in Lira Borelli, if we're, if we're thinking about it in terms of uh, Commedia dell'arte acting, like which part of the body do you lead with, then I would say for Borelli, it's a lot of times it's chin first, and then sort of moving out with the head up, which always strikes me as being very peculiar <laughs> not necessarily f always flattering but very an interesting way of sort of approaching a scene um but yeah a, a lot of people have lamented or lamented when when sound um became a thing that film was now going to become more like theater again because the the, the one thing or or one of the many things that film had that um you know, that had going for it is that it was such a physical medium that acting was uh, a physical language and we didn't have to cheat by using our voice. And in fact, if you take a, take a film course at, uh, at Tisch, one of the first things we'll try to do is sh show, don't tell, um, sort of going back to the silent film tradition. Right. Yeah, I think you could have watched this without any titles and still you wouldn't have gotten a sense of what it was about for the most and part. Actually, thank you for bringing up the question of titles because it was sort of at some point I kind of was commenting with Mila and they were saying that the titles are just fantastic because they are not just telling us what's happening, but they are kind of commenting on, on what's happening. I mean, and of course they are very, uh, very poetical in uh, of course for the standards of the time you know, there's this language which, which is almost kind of denuncio style of course and uh, um and, and 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 then i thought you know it's really more about giving us keys to get into the story and its meaning rather than simply telling us what's happening because what's happening is fairly is fairly clear um and then i thought um in your presentation earlier you brought up two interesting passages from the sort of original kind of um, poster of the film and the original title, which included this subtitle, uh, which was um, Messo in scena con raro senso pittorico. You know, this idea of something brought on stage with a very sort of rare, peculiar, uh, uh, recherche kind of senso pittorico, sense of painting, which of course has to do with what we see um, very, very strongly. And then the other term, um, which brings us back to the music, is the fact that the soundtrack is defined commento musicale, right? It's not just um, a soundtrack. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something which is meant to add an element of commentary to, uh, to, what we, to what we see. And I think this speaks so well to your point, which is also crucial to your book, about how these various sister arts are getting together here um, in what is um, a very hybrid kind of kind of work. Yeah, I think the there are a number of Italian films who make more of a point of this. Um, 
the, the last time we were here, or I was here when we presented Il Fauno, for instance, uh, the director himself, Febo Mari, sort of addresses the audience in a tuxedo, standing against velvet curtains, and then he opens the curtains onto a scene of the film. Um, you know, in a similar way that this film opens with, oh, she's thinking about Faust and his deal, and then we see a painting that's sort of vaguely based off of the uh, Eugène Delacroix classic um, Faustian depiction, the, the famous French painting. And obviously we have our um, Mephistopheles character right. uh, stepping out of that quite yeah. nicely. The yeah. tableau vivant, which actually gets to be real, totally yes. real. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about that other... Uh, I was wondering about uh, Faust uh, himself in the, uh, <laughs> in the painting. Is there someone just sitting very motionless? <laughs> Well, Mephistopheles is, yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> but that's a great. I mean, I think that's sort of a moment of genius in this in, in in this film. Another element which struck my attention because you know you mentioned it, um, and then I was paying particular attention to it is the use of mirrors. Of course, mirrors are extremely interesting here because mirrors are a symbol of vanity, and uh, partly the mirror is the uh, one of the first objects which. Um, um, Alba is holding um, in her hands at the beginning of the film and then of course we have the surface of the water which does work as a mirror but that's also a reference to the myth of Narcissus you know how many uh, uh, male Narcissus we have in, in the history of painting you know sort of overlooking the water and then we have at least two moments where actual mirrors come up in the movie one of them is during the um, uh, costume ball uh, when, uh, interestingly enough, she is wearing this um, costume, which actually made me think about Thais, or this kind of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of courtesan from this very Orientalist uh, tradition. And then at some point, she's really looking at herself um, in the mirror. And then again, there's a virtuoso vir mirror moment at the end of the movie, when we have this image of um, uh, Alba uh, almost uh, multiplied in that mirrors in and at some point i think we see her at least in three different uh, versions if not four um and that seems to be uh, i think a super brilliant idea to sort of showcase the struggle she is she's going through at that point yeah the the use of the mirror was quite commonplace in terms of trying to get get everyone to believe that we're in an actual space and not a set i mean there was a moment towards the end where uh, Lida Borelli is sort of writhing against the wall, and I heard some laughter because you could see the walls moving, <laughs> uh, which makes it clear that we're on a set. But to, to partially to try and prevent us from, you know, knowing that we're on a set, there were these added mirrors that would reveal spaces that we would, you know, otherwise maybe think were offset, you know, that didn't exist. That was maybe cameras, gear, and then the other thing it does is, um, like in some of the. Uh, you know, great um, Tarkovsky or Antonioni films is that the mirrors allow you to introduce another plane of action altogether. Yeah. So a lot of times um, in, the, in the Italian, Danish, French films of the period, there will be a key piece of information to the plot, but the only way you will see it is because it's reflected in a mirror in the background. Uh, it's someone entering in the same way that Mephisto is sort of peeking through the curtains. Right. Um, and this is just a, a virtuoso way of long take staging that they got really good at and used to. But of course, yeah, certainly the moment at the end is, it's her literally sort of coming apart, multiplying. Yeah. There's one mirror set up at a weird angle. There's another here. There's one that we can't see. And then there's... Um, herself as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's a beautiful, beautiful scene where, uh, again, I guess we haven't, we haven't really mentioned the color either, right? That's another right. part that I think plays into this is that um, wh while most, most films were in color using some type of tinting, which is basically dyeing the entire print or toning, which is taking out the uh, chemical components, the silver halide crystals, which are uh, black and replacing them with a colored uh, chemical. This one also had uh, hand stenciling and in some points hand painting on top of the other two methods. So while you would always have gone to see a film in color, uh, most likely if you were seeing films in this period, this one does stand out as having even more components to it. Like it's really, it, it's alive, it's loose. The, the hand stenciling they had gotten away from much earlier, yeah. but to reintroduce it, 
kind of feels a it gives an extra effect to the clothes that you mentioned that are so I think every scene has a new costume for yeah. Lida Borelli and so we see it in these vibrant uh in these vibrant colors yeah, as which well. of course have a very sort of symbolic value as well because I think you know color here is part of the story I mean beginning with the um the cloak of um of Mephistophele you know I mean this kind of red reddish sort of thing and then we sort of have symbolic colors coming up throughout uh, I mean one point which um uh I would like to also make um and then we may sort of open um the floor for questions from the audience uh, has to do with names because of course you know this woman is called Alba Doltrevita which of course you know it's it's such a fascinating name again very sort of uh, you know she might be the character of a denuncio um of a denuncio novel um and then we have the two brothers i mean one of them is very trivially called Sergio i mean nothing against the name Sergio but it's certainly not a particularly resounding name but the other guy is called Tristano right i mean which of course rings a bell uh, uh, especially in that sort of context and, you know, brings uh, up all sorts of cultural references, Tristan being uh, one of them. And then even the idea of this um, sort of interaction of, of stories, because on the one hand we have the Faust myth, um, but read in a very gendered kind of way, because of course, you know, the real Faust is obsessed with youth, but also with knowledge. I mean, um, uh, Alba Doltrevita doesn't really seem to be much concerned with knowledge, and most of the problem here has to do with youth and uh, and beauty. So that's another interesting sort of uh, uh, dimension to this uh, portrayal of the uh, the protagonist, uh, this kind of female Faust, yet very different from what Faust is in the Goethe sort of tradition. Yeah, I mean, it's in that regard, it's definitely a blend of, of a number of different things. I mentioned uh, Salome also earlier. There's this idea that across these uh, different films, and maybe what sets the, uh, the diva films apart from other European traditions are these, uh, not just strong female characters, but strong female characters who drive men to suicide and enjoy doing so. <laughs> so... Um, you know, there's there's Il Fuoco, there's Tigre Reale, there's uh, the film you'll see tomorrow. Uh, there's this one. There's this sort of uh, yeah, this this idea of power in femininity and sexuality um, that we find in, in not just several myths, but that seems to be you know a, in some way a, a creation of the Italian cinema of itself, like its own perpetuating myth of the diva. Um, so. So yeah, as much as uh, Wagner maybe wants to have his say in this, it's it, it seems to be a very peculiar kind of. Yeah. I think that's just a, it, there's so many th almost throwaway references here that um, it, it, it's hard to sort of go into. I think all of them. I think Nino Auxilia also wrote a play uh, about Tristan and Isolde. I'd have to double check this, but there's a very very popular myth to write about also in poetry. Right. Um, yeah, you can definitely go go into this again and again and sort of pick it apart and try to find the the various references and the fact that the Narcissus myth is then also sort of right. inverted um, is also an interesting touch there. I mean, in the end, it's not... Um, what, what always strikes me is how... Because uh, the divas are sometimes described f by people who haven't seen all of the films as very hysterical and big and larger than life, but it's the men who are very sort of weak and hysterical in these movies, yes. like the, the idea of the, the flesh being weak, which is also, I guess, at the core of the Salome myth, you know? Yeah. And, uh, dance for me and take off your clothes and I'll give you everything. It's essentially what the Salome myth is about. Um, and then, you know, inevitably, there, there comes the demand of, all right, then, then die. <laughs> die for yeah. me. Um, so yeah, I'd... Uh, I've, I, Although we have all these references, I think it, it seems to be just it, very much its own thing also. Yeah. Just totally. fascinating. Yeah, that is true. Um, okay, um, questions from the audience. We do have some time for... Um, yes, I think there's a mic um, coming around. I have a, a curiosity, a technical question. First of all, I was uh, want to tell you that and I was so fascinated because I never saw like a, a black and white film painted like in a sense post-produced because I work in post-production and I could see the really, really, really early stage of 
color grading on post-production. That was really fascinating. But my question was, I noticed that certain scenes, they appear, especially the interior of the house, was yellowish. Compared to the outside, it was more greenish cyanis. You mentioned like that the film got a special chemical treatment during the negative, during the, um, the develop the develop of the film. But what they were using this special chemical treatment in the developing in an artistic way. So, for example, the interior of the house was more yellowish, but I'm not talking about the painting. Overall, the frame looks. So were they using that in a, in, to give some more color to the to the story? Yeah, so the, there were there were companies that were set up like you have post production uh, colorist companies today that will you know go company three or you go somewhere to get your color done for your film. Back then you had uh, a number of different processes and every big city had number of companies and they would just give you catalogs of colors. Uh, so there would be all kinds of tints of yellow, all types of tints of red, all types of tints of blue. And then what filmmakers would generally do is pick colors for every scene. And sometimes even within the scene, they would switch colors. So in this one, because there is some deterioration and we have a combination of three processes. So first tinting, which is just applying a dye to the film, toning, which is then replacing the silver halide crystals. And you can do both of those at the same time so that your, your blacks in the film actually get a color. So your blacks would be blue and then the rest of the film, the whites would appear yellow, for instance. And then hand stenciling was applied on top of that. Um, so those are like three different pro uh, processes. Um, but so in, in short, yes, people would just get a catalog, they would work with a certain company and the director um, and cinematographer would pick the colors per scene. There are some standard things, like if it's a nighttime scene, for the most part, they would use blue to indicate that it's night. If there's a fire, they would often tint the inside, the entire scene red to give that a little bit more effect. Uh, but apart from that, it was just sort of dealer's choice. What's the mood of the scene? How does it feel? Um, and what, what do you want to make the audience feel with those colors? Um, you, you can find those like early color catalogs online. Um, they're, they're quite fascinating to look at. And the colors you can't, it's very hard to replicate digitally also. Um, the George Eastman House in Rochester still gives workshops about how to tone film, how to, how to um, change out the uh, silver halide crystals to, uh, you know, feronium and whatever the other uh, <laughs> chemicals are that they use. But it's still something you can do today, yeah. Um, I also should mention that this was, these were all nitrate fi uh, film prints. So that's the base of the film, which was highly flammable, but mm. uh, people uh, tended to think that it looked a lot better. So even if they, ac they actually already held an alternative uh, in the early 1920s, they continued to use it until the late 1930s, even though it would, like a small strip would just set this whole theater ablaze because it has oxygen inside of it. So it keeps burning, even if you add water to it. Um, so imagine a whole print of that in a projection booth. Um, but so the colors on that also look like something you can't replicate. The George Eastman House, again, has a nitrate film festival where they project nitrate. And their projection room is entirely encased in iron and has a switch that will allow the, pro the projectionist to get out because if the film gets stuck in front of the lens, it will start to burn and then it will just... You can find clips online. I like showing these to my students. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's not good, yeah, <laughs> but it looks great. Yeah. Rapsodia Satani, yeah. Uh, we have two questions. In this period, when they were showing the silent films, did they always follow a score? Or let's say the orchestra only played for the opening, and then, as you say, we're left with a piano and a violin. Did they, though, they try to follow that same score, or were they ever improvising? Uh, I think they were mostly always improvising. Yeah. So for for this type of setup, it, it wouldn't have been realistic that every screening would have had an orchestra. And in fact, m you know, there were some of the big cinema palaces who would have had orchestras, but even they would have just generally improvised. And there are there exist um, uh, music sheets with cues so that you sort of know. Uh, that went around in the period for, for especially for a companyist that would say love action drama and you could buy sets of those and you could sort of play those depending on what you're looking at um, and that's also what most people still go do today if you go to moma or lincoln center you have a silent film 
one, they'll very rarely have scores. And then two, uh, the, the pianist, usually pianists, accompanists will have rarely had time to see the film beforehand. So they're just going off of what they see, which is qu quite a quite a skill to pull off. I've had it happen often in uh, Belgium when uh, the film museum would screen films, a pianist would come and he would be like, what's this film? It, and someone would say, it's a Western. And he'd be like, all right. <laughs> and that's, they, that, that would be his cue. It's very formulaic. I mean, they have kind of this idea of using sort of sort of light motifs in a way. Right? I mean, that's an interesting yeah. uh, way of having a, a set of. I mean, I also sort of I remember reading um, in sort of scholarship on this particular aspect that uh, this case here, the Mascagni sound, um, soundtrack, uh, is really a unicum. And anyway, I seem to recall that uh, he also conducted it on the first um, sort of screening. I mean, I read somewhere uh, that. So you know, it, it's really very special. Um, thing and we are very lucky to still um, have it. Uh, there was another question. Yes, uh, I'm intrigued by your title of uh, c cinema in art as a cinema as a filmmaker. Uh, it's said that a good film will stand on its own without sound, just in, in terms of experiencing it. The the other point of reference that, that got my attention was a Abel Gantz shot a Jacques as a silent film and then had the actors act say the words and then when when film came when sound came in he added the voiceover and most of the actors which, which is one of my favorite films uh, died in the film most of the uh, extras at the Battle of Verdun. Um, my, my question is something that Al Albert Mazels once said to me. He said a, uh, he was jealous of still photographers because a still photographer, everything is in the frame. Whereas a moving image, you're always wondering what's happening next. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a thinker. Um, I mean, I, I've heard a lot of cinematographers talk about this very idea who, who prefers still photographs, uh, still photographs like Roger Deakins, who will, you know, go out with his camera all day and just take maybe one still photograph and will be very pleased that that's sort of the end of it. Um, uh, I, I think, yes, there's, on the one hand, there's this idea that you're always thinking of what's next, and it's a like a lot of the Italians writing in this period on film would say it's a time-based medium, and so um, like with any film, whether it's narrative or not, it will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, in this case, it also has room to change the reels for the projection, hence end prologue, end part one, and then part two, so that we have some time to change the reels. Um, but uh, but yeah, in terms of in terms of expectation to go along with that, uh, in terms of thoughts, um, I will say that uh, I don't necessarily make a difference between the sort of the world that lives outside of viewing an artwork or a still photograph, what it does to your mind, um, and then a film. You know, as as in terms of how it affects you, I think there's it, there is inevitably an end unless it's a unless you're watching slow cinema and it's eight hours or nine hours and then the end rare, you know, um, doesn't come so quickly. But, but the impact I would say is, is more or less the same. I'm not sure from a, from an artistic point of view related to, to silent film, whether I could say more about that. I will say that it, it was common for a film shot in the late 1920s to, and even the ones earlier to get sort of a sound do over. Um, when when sound did come along, because it was much easier to sort of post dub them, um, as opposed to recording sound on set, um, you know. See also most Italian films from the 1960s, which were shot silently on set and then post dub because everyone was speaking different languages, and right. you know. Um, and then there's also, of course, that myth that whenever you see someone talking in a silent film, they're saying the most profane things. Uh, but a lot of times it does actually follow the titles, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Um, Stefano. Thank you so much for the presentation and for bringing even more to life in the, the film. Uh, 
just a thought, when we were talking about the sound that has a life of its own, and he is perfectly fine listening to it, and the microphone is not working. Oh. Okay. No. So the, the soundtrack is a, is a life of its own. It's a, it's a beautiful concert on, on itself. The visual of the film is stunning, even without the music. Yeah. And the words also have a life of themselves because they're not explanatory, but they add a further layer to the understanding of the film. And that's it. And you mentioned the Nunzio that is basically the uh, invitato di Pietra, the stone uh, guest in this whole thing, because he despised cinema, for, if you listen to him. And he participated in the Cabiria uh, that in the posters was sold as Un dramma di Gabriele D'Annunzio. Gabriele D'Annunzio had nothing to do with it. And basically, I think he recycled poems that he had already written for other things. And the poems there are, and the intertitles there are poems, mostly the prayers to the different gods during the human sacrifices. They actually confuse the viewer if the viewer expects to understand something of the action through the titles, because Danuzzi couldn't care less about helping you understand what goes on in terms of facts. But he wanted to add a further layer of pure poetry, poetry prayer in, in his own style. So it's, I think the, the amazing thing in, 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 in Vito's uh, observation is that the, the synthesis of m many art forms in one, and the fact is that each of them could stand by itself and be a great artistic work, and then the ability of bringing them together to create something even better and more profound. It's a, uh, but each of them is like has the, the possibility to stand uh, by itself. Just an observation. Yeah, I would be curious to to see if anyone <laughs> finds any any reference to some of these films being performed live when it comes to the titles, because there are traditions of that. Um, the Netherlands had had people who would read the intertitles for silent films, uh, a little bit like the Japanese Benchi who would, who would perform the titles. And so a lot of times people came to see the, those performers because they did such a good job rather than the films. So they, they, they came for those people. So I could see that working in an Italian setting as well where we'd have a poet, uh, you know, on the side of the stage bringing us these, these poetic intertitles um, just live. But not that I know of either, no, no. But maybe for a next screening, any any poets? We could give it a try. It seems to be an interesting format to experiment with. Yeah. Right. Um, I think we are unfortunately. Well, maybe we have time for one final question. I see one hand down there. Um. So after you've pointed all this out, it'd be really nice to see it again. So the question is, would it actually be possible to screen it again right now if enough people <laughs> wanted to stick around? <laughs> I mean, it's, not, it's not late. You're right, it's a short film. Uh, yeah, I would uh, make a personal plea to the organizers, maybe. And uh, But you're right, it is, after all that information, it's good to see it. How many people would want to see again. it again? <laughs> Raise your hands. Yeah, I'm, af I'm afraid. I'm afraid we have sort of you know our staff who's been here Just all day. The yeah. um, okay. then and the other it's meter time as well. So well, maybe you know we can sort of take this invitation and try to maybe uh, redo uh, it in the future at some point. Uh, um. Otherwise, how can one see this? Are, gonna, are they going to be or are they? Or they will be available as a DVD, say. Uh, this is an interesting question, and I have no idea about the availability of these films. For I, I want to say the Cinema Ritrovato did a DVD with Rapsodia Satanica as well, um, or with a couple of DV films, I believe. So you can get that. But where? On the internet. <laughs> or in Bologna. Go this summer, go to uh, Il Cinema Ritrovato. It's a great experience. <laughs> and. People from Criteria Sometimes they. Libraries here also have it. I, uh, the NYU library has it, for instance, that I know. Oh. So, or they will very soon. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I would like to give another round of applause for uh, Vito um, at Rianzens. Thank you for sharing.
all this great information and thank you all for joining us tonight.